Epoch attempts to leap into the future, but really, it's just the beginning of the end. It's NES Works Gaiden Epoch, Episode 4. Everything would change for Japan's home games industry in the summer of 1983, when both Nintendo and Sega launched their first proper consoles into the world. Especially Nintendo's console, which hosted as close to a perfect home port of Donkey Kong as the world had ever seen. But wouldn't you know it, the ever-clone-happy Epoch beat them to the punch, kinda sorta, by about nine months, with Monster Mansion in October of 1982. At this point, Epoch has finally said farewell to their standalone console roots, setting their sights on more contemporary game styles. And what better way to follow up a Pac-Man knockoff than with a derivative of the next big arcade hit to have come along in history? By the end of 1982, games inspired by Donkey Kong had become more or less standard fare. Some of them did extraordinarily well for themselves, perhaps most notably Sunsoft's Kangaroo, though none managed to eclipse the popularity or quality of Nintendo's original creation. I'd rank Monster Mansion as one of the lesser efforts on this front. Although I'd hardly call it lacking, it does lack the variety and appeal of the real thing. That said, given the constraints of the hardware, it does an admirable job of getting the point across. The hardware that powered the cassette vision hails from the mid to late 1970s, having been constructed for the purpose of playing Pong alikes. The fact that it could deliver a reasonably satisfactory take on a considerably more advanced arcade hit speaks well to the sheer determination that powered Epoch's development staff. Here, they emulate the proverbial scientists who were so busy asking if they could, they never stopped to ask if they should. Monster Mansion tells the tale of Taro-kun, a guy who wants to save his girlfriend Hanako from monsters that have kidnapped her, as 8-bit monsters so often did. In order to effect this rescue, Taro-kun needs to perform a handful of arcane tasks that will allow him to climb to the upper floor of a stage where the monster has secured Hanako. Monster Mansion plays out over the course of three stages, all of which feature an identical layout and objective, and simply throw more challenges in your way to complicate your efforts. This immediately puts it a step or three behind Kong and its better flavor of clones, which tended to mix up stage layouts and mechanics from level to level to keep things interesting. Still, the game wears its aspirations on its sleeves. The three stages each take place in a single story of the eponymous mansion, which appears at the beginning of each stage, just like the meter marker prompts in Donkey Kong's arcade version. The higher you get, the more lights appear in the windows of the mansion. Once you reach the top story and reach the monster, it plummets to the ground and you reunite with Hanako as the word love wafts into view. Again, nothing subtle about the inspirations behind this one, especially once you start playing. The bulk of the action in Monster Mansion consists of running and jumping, climbing ladders, while avoiding rolling spikes and monsters. In the first stage, you need to climb four ladders while avoiding the spiked balls that the monster at the top tosses at you. These work more or less like Donkey Kong's barrels, rolling to the end of a platform, dropping to the next lowest level, and reversing direction, and so on, until they either roll off the screen or murder Taro-kun. As in Kikori no Yosaku, you'll find the most difficult thing in this game to be simply jumping these hazards. They require almost perfect timing if you don't want to impale yourself on them as you leap forward over them. Again, in a seemingly contradictory fashion, you'll find that leaping the barrels becomes much easier at higher difficulty levels since the increased speed of the hazards gives your floaty jump more clearance time. Unlike in Donkey Kong, simply climbing to the top of the level accomplishes nothing. You can't reach the monster in Hanako at all because you won't find a ladder hanging from the top tier. Instead, you need to summon a ladder, I guess, by traversing all four of the ladders connecting the lower levels. Climbing up or down a ladder for the first time permanently changes its color, Qbert style. And only after you've shifted the palette for every ladder will the final ladder appear. At that point, you simply need to scramble up to the top level and make your way to the barrier that the monster is hidden behind to scare him away to the next level. Then the next level carries forward the same framework and the same ladder rules, but it replaces the rolling spike balls with a single monster that shuffles across the screen toward Taro-kun in its current location. Another new feature appears here, checkpoints, several of which hang from the ceiling of each level and need to be triggered as a secondary requirement to making the upper ladder appear. You activate a checkpoint by leaping into it, all while avoiding the invader's looking critter that wanders toward you. You can leap over the monster, though it will immediately reverse its direction and come after you. You can also leap and grab a cross that appears near the upper right of the screen, directly below Hanako. The cross will cause the mini monster to run away from you, and if you manage to smack it while wielding your crucifix, 
the power of Christ will compel it to vanish for a moment and appear again in the bottom level, where it makes a single mindless pass at the ground floor before resuming its chase. The final stage in each cycle combines every factor into a single challenge. The boss monster chucks rolling spikes at you, the mini monster roams the floor, and you need to hit checkpoints and climb ladders in order to be able to advance. But it's all worth it for love. As you play through multiple loops of the game, the enemies grow faster and more aggressive. The barrel stand-ins gain the ability to roll down ladders instead of just falling off the platform edges, the mini-monster becomes smarter, and everything moves faster, except Taro-kun. The smaller monster becomes the biggest X-factor players need to negotiate as they play. As the difficulty advances, this thing doesn't simply move more quickly, it becomes a lot smarter, anticipating the player's actions doing a surprisingly good job of moving a step ahead of you to catch you unaware. The invader's guy always heads toward your current level of the mansion, where it will emerge from a specific side of the screen before wobbling in your direction. At higher difficulty levels, however, it gains the ability to recognize when you're about to move to a different level or lure it into a trap, so it will hang back rather than making a beeline for you. Eventually, it will actually start climbing or descending to the level you plan to move to before you actually get there. Thankfully, Monster Mansion controls a lot better than you might expect, which means you only need to manage the actual intended challenges of the game rather than conquering clumsy hardware, too. As we saw with Pack Pack Monster, the cassette vision doesn't really lend itself to Post Invaders gaming concepts due to its weird array of hardwired inputs. Happily, Monster Mansion takes its cue from Kikori no Yosaku and maps your lateral controls to the left lever rather than forcing you to maneuver in four directions with a linear button array. The majority of your movements here play out along the x-axis, so this proves surprisingly effective. The control scheme assigns the jump command to one button, which doubles as the mechanism for climbing ladders. And then you can slide down ladders with a second button. All in all, it's pretty okay. It definitely feels more advanced than you'd expect from Cassette Vision, and it works pretty well. Monster Mansion unsurprisingly does not have roots in Epoch's standalone titles, but it does appear to call back to one of the company's LCD handhelds, a Donkey Kong-derived game called Monster Panic. Although the Cassette Vision title doesn't exactly play like Monster Panic, it comes a lot closer than Pack Pack Monster did to Epic Man. Epic made dozens of LCD games in the early 1980s, most of which seemed to riff on hits by other companies. Some imitated the mechanics of arcade hits, while others just lifted their names. Besides Pack Pack Man, you also had Oil Gang, seemingly a reference to Nintendo's Oil Panic Game & Watch, Invader from Space, not even subtle, Space Defender, swiping Space Invaders and Defender, Money Panic and Monster Panic, biting off UPL's Space Panic, Galaga X6, a Star Wars arcade clone not actually sold under license from Lucasfilm or Namco, and Astro Wars. Surprisingly though, our next game seems to have nothing to do with LCD releases like Astro Wars, Astro Cops, or Astro Thunder 7. Curiously, nothing shipped for the Epic Cassette Vision in the winter or spring of 1983, meaning that when Sega and Nintendo arrived on the scene, Epic's system appeared to be effectively moribund. That illusion would shatter the following month when Epic released Astro Command. But the question is, should they have bothered? Given its title, Astro Command really seems like it should have been a clone of Missile Command, but it wasn't. No, with this cartridge, Epoch looked to a different seminal arcade hit altogether, namely Konami's Scramble. Here, as in that horizontally scrolling shooter, you control a space fighter that needs to shoot things while avoiding collisions and running out of gas. Your ship wields the unique ability to fire off a couple of projectiles at a time, but while the enemy fleet can't fire back, it consists of vast numbers of ships whose pilots seem to have little regard for their own well-being. As you fly toward your goal, enemy rocket ships will launch and attempt to smash into you, while various other craft will attempt to steer themselves toward you. Meanwhile, your craft only has 10 units of fuel, which tick down one increment every few seconds. As in Scramble, and Zaxxon, and Zoom 909, etc., you can only top off your juice by gunning down fuel tanks. Their destruction causes your fuel meter to increase by one point. Unlike Scramble, however, Astro Command doesn't give players a secondary weapon with which to bomb these ground-based gas tanks from above. You can only fire straight ahead here, which means that, as in Zaxxon, you need to swoop in and take out fuel tanks with direct fire in order to claim the juicy gas or whatever inside. Happily, Astro Command once again offers a more manageable control scheme than you might expect from the Cassette Vision's dated input options. As in Monster Mansion, Epoch's designers put the control lever to work here as the main input tool, even though your fighter craft primarily moves up and down. Pressing left on the lever causes you to ascend, while pressing right makes you dive. 
Even though this doesn't represent a one-to-one -one control scheme, it somehow makes intuitive sense and takes very little time to master. In addition to the altitude lever, Astro Command only gives you two other control options. First, the leftmost button operates your forward cannon, allowing you to fire up to two shots at once to take out the bad guys and gas tanks ahead of you. The second button operates your engines and causes your fighter to dart forward. Your thrusters will take you a little ways beyond the midpoint of the screen, which gives you less time to react to oncoming dangers, but also allows you to maneuver laterally and weave between hazards. Once you release the thrust button, your ship holds a stationary position against the scenery, steadily falling back to the left edge of the screen at the same rate that the background scrolls left. As you hold static relative to the environment, you can move up and down with impunity, which proves incredibly useful for angling in to take out fuel tanks and navigating within crowded spaces. And the simple fact that Astro Command features forward scrolling deserves mention. Here we have hardware designed to move rectangles up and down to hit little squares, and somehow it's rendering buildings and barriers and shifting everything forward even as your ship and various enemies move independently. Honestly, as primitive as this game looks, it's an absolute miracle on the Cassette Vision hardware. You can see the system straining to keep up at times. I found that the sequences that involve vertical barriers and almost resemble a Gradius speed zone tend to struggle and at times almost feel like the entire program is on the verge of a crash. But the system soldiered on despite asking this console to do things God never intended. In fact, Astro Command actually gets one over on Scramble by including an actual honest-to-god boss that honestly feels like a loose sketch for a Gradius boss. Consisting of a large frame that houses a regenerating missile, the boss at the end of each loop has to be hit several times in its protected core before it explodes. The missile that it launches fires from the core, meaning that you need to work your way past the core in order to have a clear shot of the boss's weak point. And hey, wouldn't you know it? Your ship has a thruster that allows you to push forward into the screen, allowing you to clear the missile's path and take a few shots at the boss before another missile regenerates. Honestly, Astro Command exceeds the on-paper capabilities of the cassette vision. It really doesn't seem like the console should be capable of hosting a game like this, and yet, here we are. Clearly, this miracle of programming didn't do anything to give the cassette vision a leg up on the Famicom or SG-1000, which shipped a few weeks before Astro Command's debut. But sometimes a game doesn't need to be a hit or change the course of history to be remarkable. It simply needs to exist. Here's to clearing those low bars. Next episode, Epoch gives in to the inevitable, and we bid farewell to the cassette vision. And that's just super.